Welcome to the course. My name is Brett Romero, and I am going to be your instructor throughout this course. Before we get into any kind of coding, um, I imagine a lot of you are not familiar with Erlang, so I'm gonna give you some background about the language, where it came from, and kind of what you can do with it as well. Then we're going to get into some code and where to get the environment for running Erlang code also. All right, so features of Erlang. One of the features is lightweight concurrency, so it's able to run multiple processes at one time. And this is a key feature for its ability to handle fault tolerance, so its ability to keep running even when programs crash. And we're gonna get into details about how that works shortly. Another feature is there's no shared data because that doesn't really scale too well. So there's really good containment of data that you can't kind of go across memory spaces and have it shared. And this allows for really great massive scaling, you can say, of an Erlang program. There's also mutability, so you can't change uh, the assignment of a variable once it's assigned. So if you want to overwrite a variable that you've already created, you can't do it. And another reason of this, it just makes tracking of things going on in programs a lot easier. There's also fault isolation. So this is localization of faults, which helps with keeping the program up and running um, a high percentage of the time. Then we have self-healing. So there's this ability in Erlang to do hot swapping of code. So basically what it means is while the program is running, you can swap code in and out. And that's another feature that helps with the great uptime that Erlang programs usually have. So it is a simple functional language. And if you're maybe familiar with in the .NET world, F Sharp or other kinds of functional languages, Erlang behaves the same way. We also have dynamically typed variables. So there's no declaration of this is a string, this is an integer or a Boolean or anything like that. And if you're coming maybe from a Python background, you're very familiar with this or use of .NET's var keyword, for example, that helps with dynamically typing a language. So whatever, whenever you're assigning to a variable, whatever you're doing on the right side of the assignment, so the kind of data that you're putting into the variable, that's how Erlang determines what's going on there. So if it's a string, it's in quotes, then the variable is gonna be string-based, basically. And you don't have to declare explicitly that it is a string. There's no user-defined data type, so you're not creating classes or anything like that. You're only using what is there inside of the language. And again, this goes back to high availability of an Erlang program. So, so if you start defining your own user types, it brings in more complexity. So by keeping things simple, it's easier for Erlang to manage what's going on in a program. We have built-in concurrency primitives, so you get these particular kind of types that work really well with concurrency. And as well, there's built-in error handling primitives, so both of these help with uptime. So you have the particular types that work well with error handling inside of Erlang, and then there's not uh, custom defined types that maybe you can do in other languages where you're defining a specific type of exception. So that's not really something you can do in Erlang. So it's really keeping control of what's going on in the program in regards to types and the types that it wants you to use. Then we have built-in distribution primitives. So this again goes back to Erlang's keeping control over types that do particular kinds of things. And this these distribution primitives allow for really great scalability of Erlang programs. They're kind of one of the cornerstones of why an Erlang program can scale so well. So Erlang again is just 
keeping control over what's going on, keeping things simple, and that allows for this uptime, this concurrency, this great scaling that it has. And Erlang is a declarative language. Um, so like some of the functional languages that are out there, they're kind of declarative. And um, so if go back into um, something like .NET where you have XAML um, and you're creating a Windows WPF based application, the forms, the designer side are all declarative. So you're using an XML based syntax. And then there's, of course, HTML is a declarative language. XML is declarative. So those kinds of languages are very expressive. And then we've discussed that Erlang is a functional based language. So in the code snippets that we're going to run, you'll see how that works, what it looks like as well. We've talked about how it's concurrent. So I'm just kind of going over a lot of the basic features that we're going to have available to us in Erlang. There's also fault tolerance. This is a uh, very important for keeping the program up and running. It's handling of fault tolerance. It's built-in primitives that it has for that as well. There's garbage collection inside of the runtime for Erlang also. So it helps with memory management, keeping things clean and not allowing an Erlang program to basically just keep growing and growing in memory usage. So anything that is no longer being used is getting cleared out of memory. Code hot swapping, this is the same as self-healing. So a few different terms about how that works. So it's Erlang's ability to swap code in while the program remains up and running. All right, so go back to the origins of Erlang. It was created by a company called Ericsson, which, as you might know, develops um, cell phones. So back in the early 80s, they needed a program or a language that had great uptime and would scale very well that could handle all the large amount of processing that they needed. And that's where Erlang came from. Erlang was designed to build systems that never go down. There's constant uptime. And one of the key people in the development of Erlang and advocate for Erlang, Joe Armstrong, had this to say about Erlang's uptime. There's no more than four minutes of downtime per year or 99.99999 uptime. So that's five nines. Now, it goes even further than that. So some programs have less than four minutes of downtime per year. And this is kind of going back to what do you mean about never go down? What does never mean? So this is what never means, basically. It might sound kind of strange, but early programs crash. So rather than designing a program to handle all scenarios that can go wrong, developers just let their programs crash. So you might be wondering, if there's so much uptime in an Erlang program, how is it that it can crash and still have great uptime? The way this works is that the developer will focus on processes and interactions, which are the same thing as messages. So by focusing on the process and not worrying about if other processes will crash, what happens is some other process will monitor when a process crashes and bring it back up. So it's a lot of processes working together that it helps to keep the program up and running. So if one crashes, it doesn't bring down the entire system. And this kind of goes back to isolation so there's not shared memory there's not shared data in the programs so that you have kind of some independence that's going on between processes and of course fault tolerance comes into play with the way that these programs can keep themselves up and running it's Erlang's ability of how it handles fault tolerance that really helps keep things going so this type of programming is called concurrency Oriented Programming, or COP is the acronym that's used for it. Next, we're going to look at Erlang facts and get into a few simple examples of Erlang code. 